Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Bayer. Hello, I am Dr. Cecile Feldman, Dean and Professor of the Rutgers University School of Dental Medicine. Welcome to this program exploring analgesic options for dental pain. It is a pleasure to be discussing with you today the different analgesic options available to help your patients manage dental pain. There are a number of goals I would like to accomplish over the next 30 minutes. Among them are reviewing the nature of dental pain, available analgesic options, including EDSEDs, non-EDSEDs, and opioids, and current perspectives on the safety and efficacy of these options. As part of this discussion, I will also reflect on the opioid epidemic and what can be done to help prevent unnecessary usage of opioids to control dental pain. Each year, over 3.5 million young adults are introduced to opioids for the first time when they have their third molars or wisdom teeth extracted. Partial and fully impacted mandibular third molars when extracted result in moderate to severe pain. To help manage this pain, surgeons will often prescribe opioids, as many believe that opioids are superior to non-opioids in pain management. Dentists have been contributors to the opioid problem, writing 8% of all opioid prescriptions, which amount to 18 million prescriptions each year. At one point, dentists were the second highest of all types of medical professionals prescribing opioids. Today, dentists have dropped to the fifth highest as many dentists have changed their prescribing habits. It should be noted that half of the opioid prescriptions provided by dentists to their patients are filled but never used to manage postoperative pain. These prescriptions are written just in case their patients need them. Thus, millions of opioid tablets can be diverted to non-medical use. This non-medical use can easily lead patients, family members, or their friends to the early steps of opioid addiction. So what conditions cause dental pain? Dental pain is multifaceted and can be categorized as being acute, chronic, or referred. While I will be spending most of today talking about acute post-surgical pain, let's take a moment to at least briefly review referred and chronic pain. Referred pain can come from several sources, including the ear, sinus, and even the heart. As the ear and sinuses are in close proximity to your teeth, referred pain from these areas should come as no surprise. But why the heart? Part of the heart is innervated by the vagus nerve, which also innervates areas close to the lower jaw. When someone is having a heart attack, pain may be referred to the mandibular jaw as a result of these vagus nerve branches. Chronic pain can be of nerve or muscular origins. Neuralgias feel like either a stabbing or a burning pain and are due to an irritation or damage to the nerve. It can be caused by pressure on the nerve, viral infections, neurologic diseases such as multiple sclerosis, and other causes such as nerve injury from surgery. Patients who are grinding their teeth together, usually at night, or clenching their teeth together will also feel muscular pain, headaches, or odontogenic pain. A telltale sign of clenching or grinding is sore muscles or a sense of your facial muscles feeling tired. Most aren't aware that they are clenching or grinding. Night or occlusal guards can often break this habit without requiring pain medication. Tooth sensitivity is also affected by gingival recession. Gingival recession will often leave tooth cementum exposed. Cementum is not as hard as enamel. It is easier to abrade and thus does not protect a tooth's nerve endings as well. Teeth that have gingival recession are often subject to tooth sensitivity, which is experienced as sensitivity to hot or cold. For this type of pain, desensitizing agents such as potassium nitrate can be very helpful. Temporal mandibular joint pain has multiple etiologies and is well beyond the scope of this program. Acute pain can be caused by injury, infection, tooth fracture, and surgery. Today, we will be spending most of our time discussing acute postoperative pain due to tooth extraction. Anyone who has experienced acute dental pain knows how unrelenting, excruciating, and tormenting it can be. 
Patients will go to almost any extreme to get relief. For many, it will be an immediate trip to their dentist's office. But unfortunately, millions of Americans either do not have a dentist or can't afford to go to their dentist. I have heard stories of individuals getting their power drill out of their garage to try to relieve dental pain. Thus, there are millions of emergency room visits each year due to dental pain. So how do you treat acute dental pain? Management includes removing the etiology and using either over-the-counter or prescription analgesics. Unfortunately, a lot of acute pain is palliatively handled due to its emergency or urgent nature. Palliative treatment, treating the symptoms but not the etiology, is only a temporary fix. Without taking care of the etiology, the pain will almost surely return. Definitive treatment removes the etiology, carries removal, gingival curatage, root canal therapy, or INDs can remove infectious agents. If the tooth has extensive caries or is so broken down that it is not salvageable, an extraction might be necessary. Third molar or wisdom tooth extractions can be particularly painful. These extractions are necessary for a variety of reasons. Over thousands of years, human evolution has reduced the size of our jaws. We used to have the need for third molars, but our diet has changed the need for large jaws and our need for third molars has declined. The loss of our third molars has evolved much slower than the shrinking of our jaws. Thus, many of us do not have sufficient space to accommodate third molars. As a result of this, crowding is often a problem. Many third molars never fully erupt, or many erupt in a way that surrounding gingival tissue is highly subject to infection. This is known as pericoronitis. As a result, third molar extraction surgery often needs to be performed. After surgery, patients usually require substantial pain management, which can be in the form of long-lasting local anesthesia, over-the-counter analgesics, or prescription analgesics. First, let's talk about over-the-counter analgesics. NSAIDs, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, are the largest class of over-the-counter medications which are commonly found in individual households. The most common NSAIDs are aspirin, ibuprofen, and naproxen. NSAIDs are particularly effective in managing acute dental pain because they have anti-inflammatory effects. As the etiology of most acute dental pain has an inflammatory component, NSAIDs are the analgesic of choice. NSAIDs can manage mild to moderate pain, can reduce fever, and some can also reduce blood clots. Aspirin, for example, reduces clotting ability and therefore is not a good choice for managing acute post-surgical pain. NSAIDs are COX-1 and COX-2 enzyme inhibitors. COX enzymes produce prostaglandins that promote inflammation and pain. Thus, NSAIDs are good analgesics. NSAIDs are metabolized in the liver. Some are known to cause heart attack or stroke. For example, the anticoagulation property of aspirin can prevent some type of strokes, such as mini strokes, but generally increase the risk of hemorrhagic strokes. Over-the-counter NSAIDs are taken orally and are known to cause bleeding and ulcers in the stomach or intestine. Aspirin and naproxen are known to cause these adverse effects with ibuprofen causing the least. Individuals who have allergies to any NSAID should not be taking any other NSAID, and anyone who is pregnant should not be taking NSAIDs, as there is evidence to suggest that NSAIDs can be harmful to a fetus. Ibuprofen and naproxen both come in over-the-counter and prescription dosages, and ibuprofen can be obtained in combination with an opioid by a prescription. Acetaminophen is a non-NSAID analgesic. It is known as a non-NSAID because it is not an NSAID, and its mechanism of action is still not fully known. Acetaminophen goes under a variety of generic names, and in the US, it is known as acetaminophen and is abbreviated as APAP. In Europe, acetaminophen is known as paracetamol. This is important to know as many stu studies use the name paracetamol rather than acetaminophen. Acetaminophen can manage mild to moderate pain and can reduce fever. It is believed that it blocks the activation of the descending serotonergic inhibitory pathway in the central nervous system. Thus, its mode of action is believed to be very different from the NSAID class of analgesics. Once thought to be extremely safe, acetaminophen is now known to cause liver toxicity. As a result, the FDA limited the amount of acetaminophen, which can be in a combination tablet, to 325 milligrams per tablet. Anyone with any type of hepatic disease should not take acetaminophen, along with anyone who has had previous hypersensitivity to the analgesic. 
Acetaminophen comes in many forms, including liquid, tablets, caplets, gel caps, and is combined with other analgesics in prescription analgesic formulations. Over-the-counter dosages come in 325 milligram tablets known as regular strength, or 500 milligram tablets known as extra strength. In order to stay below the FDA recommended maximum dosage, it is critical that your patients know the dosage that is sitting in their medicine cabinets. Now let's turn to opioids. Opioids occur naturally in the body. They bind to the mu opioid receptor to block pain signals between the brain and the body. Medical or prescription opioids work in the same way. Opioids are used to manage moderate to severe pain. They are extremely addictive and thus must be very cautiously used. When used over an extended period of time, opioid tolerance builds, requiring higher and higher dosages to get the same pain management effect. Opioids are known to cause significant side effects. These side effects can be severe enough that patients will not take them even if they have significant pain. Side effects include constipation, nausea, vomiting, sedation, euphoria, and respiratory depression. Anyone who has a history of drug abuse, respiratory disease, or is pregnant should not be given an opioid. The opioids most commonly used for dental pain are codeine, hydrocodone, and oxycodone. All are available by prescription, and all three are available in combination with acetaminophen or ibuprofen. As the pain relieving effect of different opioids vary greatly, dosages are very different, so a conversion factor has been developed. This conversion factor is known as morphine equivalent unit, units. Morphine has a morphine equivalent unit value of one. Hydrocodone is equally effective milligram per milligram. Thus hydrocodone also has a morphine equivalent unit of one. Oxycodone on the other hand is 1.5 times as effective and codeine only 0.15 times as effective. Thus more codeine would be required to get the same pain relieving effect as a milligram of hydrocodone. Many forms of dental surgery cause acute pain, some more than others. Root canal therapy involves removing the diseased pulp of a tooth. Periodontal surgery manipulates the gingival tissue surrounding a tooth. And implant placement involves osseous surgery. In all instances, inflammation occurs around the surgical site. And thus, if at all possible, NSAIDs are the preferred analgesic. When prescribing analgesics for pain, clinicians often write prescriptions like Take one or two tabs every four to six hours for pain. For these types of prescriptions, many patients try to take just one tablet when it isn't effective. They then ask for other types of pain medication, which is often an opioid. If an opioid is prescribed with the same type of prescription, the same thing can happen. In this case, patients take ineffective opioid doses, which are still addicting, but the patient's pain is not adequately addressed. Careful attention needs to be paid in provi providing prescriptions with clear instructions, and time must be taken to educate the patient on proper use of their pain medication. If not, the risk of the opioid prescription will outweigh the benefit. You are all aware of the opioid crisis and that prescription opioids are a major contributor. There are many activities which have been undertaken to prevent unnecessary opioid prescribing and to put additional controls in place. For example, in 2013, the federal government made hydrocodone a Schedule II drug, which now requires careful record keeping. Every state now has a prescription database monitoring program. These databases maintain information on all opioid prescriptions that are filled. In many states, providers must access the database prior to prescribing an opioid for their patients. In addition, some states have limited the number of days an opioid prescription can be written for. Remember to reinforce the need to take the full prescribed dosage so that your patients don't suffer from inadequate pain relief while being subjected to the adverse effects of the drug. One thing to note is that some hospitals and clinics are experimenting with defaults in their electronic medical record system. The defaults are set to a specific number of tablets an opioid prescription can be written for. While the default results in fewer opioids being prescribed when a larger quantity would normally be written, it often results in a larger number of opioids being prescribed when a smaller quantity could have been written. Rarely will a physician or dentist override a default. Dentists and physicians who prescribe opioids need to be aware that leftover tablets are available for diversion for non-medical use. 
Half of the opioid prescriptions filled for dental surgery are never used. These tablets often remain in medicine cabinets and can be abused by other members of the household or their friends. It is therefore important that you follow state law and reduce the number of opioid tablets you prescribe. And remember, if your EMR does have a default, please overwrite the default if you don't believe your patient requires the default number of tablets. The PDMP, or the Prescription Database Monitoring Program, has helped reduce the number of opioid prescriptions. Rules vary from state to state. It is therefore important that you become familiar with your state's rules. When prescribing, remember to log into the system and check the history of your patient's usage of opioid-containing drugs and assess whether the pattern reflects an addiction. If it does, then the opioid should not be prescribed and you should consider referring your patient to an addiction counselor or an addiction program. In 2015, the American Dental Association published a manuscript for pain management. Included was a recommendation for analgesic prescriptions developed for different levels of pain. The recommendations suggest that for moderate to severe pain, there should be an initial fixed time period in which analgesics should be religiously taken. After the fixed period, patients can then have the option of taking their prescribed analgesic as needed. This slide shows those recommendations. For mild pain, no fixed period is required. For mild to moderate pain, they recommend ibuprofen be taken consistently every six hours for the first 24 hours, and then switch to ibuprofen every four to six hours as needed. For moderate to severe pain, a combination of ibuprofen and acetaminophen is recommended every six hours for the first 24 hours and then as needed for pain. The combination is suggested as each analgesic affects a different pain pathway causing a synergistic effect. It is only for severe pain that opioids be considered for the first 24 to 48 hours. Once the fixed interval period is over, then the recommendation is for an ibuprofen acetaminophen combination. These recommendations are very valuable, but the wide latitude makes implementation challenging. Now let's take a moment to talk about how testing of an analgesic is performed. Before a drug is brought to market, safety and efficacy testing needs to be completed. Even after a drug has been FDA approved, additional clinical trials may be performed to demonstrate a drug's efficacy or effectiveness. There are various pain models available for this testing, with one of the most frequently used pain model being the impacted mandibular third molar extraction. The impacted mandibular third molar extraction pain model is used for a number of reasons, including its predictability, and because the surgery results in moderate to severe pain just a couple of hours after surgery. It should be noted that there are sex differences in how men and women react to analgesics. These differences are not yet well understood and they change over the lifespan. In addition, provider prescribing habits have been found to be different. For example, Medicaid women reporting to the hospital emergency department were 50% more likely to receive a prescription for opioids than men reporting to the hospital emergency department. As more research is performed, practitioners will be able to better tailor analgesics for pain management. Most efficacy studies chase pain, meaning after the surgery is completed, study participants are required to wait for the local anesthetic to wear off. Only when the pain intensity is moderate to severe does a patient receive a single dose of the study analgesic. Pain relief is then measured over the next couple of hours. In real life, we should be asking patients to take NSAIDs to get ahead of the pain as we want to achieve therapeutic doses of the NSAID before the surgical trauma has a chance to generate prostaglandins. Thus, ideally, we should be asking our patients to take an NSAID like ibuprofen either immediately before surgery, about one hour before, or immediately post-surgery before your patient leaves the office and before the local anesthetic dissipates. Just about all pain studies use the chase the pain model. In the future, hopefully more trials will be conducted looking not just at efficacy, but also at effectiveness, meaning the study is conducted in a way that simulates real practice. Rather than being limited to just one molar extraction, any number of third molars can be extracted. Patients would be told to take a dosage of analgesic prior to leaving the office and would take their analgesic for at least the first 24 
to 72 hours as maximum post-surgical pain is experienced during this time frame. Most pain efficacy studies trials compare an analgesic to a placebo. Thus, few studies are true comparative effectiveness studies. In addition, rather than just looking at pain relief, the study outcomes should reflect multiple factors that are of importance to patients. In addition to the amount of pain they feel, outcomes should include the number and severity of side effects, the ability to carry out normal daily activities, the ability to sleep, and overall satisfaction. In talking to patients, patients often prefer to put up with some discomfort in order to be able to go to work or to drive and to not have significant side effects. Thus, these normal non-traditional outcomes are equally as important as the amount of pain. There is a statistic which is known as number needed to a treat, abbreviated as NNT. Number needed to treat is a standardized measure that allows us to rank efficacy of treatment and thereby gives clinicians the ability to make clinical decisions. For analgesic studies, NNT looks at the number of patients needed to be treated in order to obtain at least 50% pain relief. A larger number means a less effective drug. For example, an analgesic which has an NNT of five means five people must be treated for one to obtain at least 50% pain relief. An NNT of five is less effective than an analgesic which has an NNT of two, meaning only two people need to be treated to find one person with at least 50% pain relief. NNT also takes into account the comparison group, which is usually a placebo. Thus, a NNT of one means that a favorable outcome occurs in every patient given the test analgesic, and no patients in the placebo or comparison group obtained the favorable outcome. Number needed to treat is calculated by dividing one by the percent patients given the active treatment or test analgesic achieving 50% pain relief, less the percent of patients given the control or placebo analgesic achieving 50% pain relief. For example, if 65% of patients receiving the test analgesic achieve 50% pain relief, and 15% of patients receiving the placebo achieve 50% pain relief, the NNT would be calculated by dividing one by 65% less 15%. This equates to one divided by 50%, which of course equals two. If there is a second trial with a different analgesic and 40% of those patients achieve 50% pain relief with the second drug, and again, 15% patients achieve 50% pain relief using the placebo, the second test analgesic would have an NNT of four. By comparing the first analgesic with an NNT of two and the second analgesic that has an NNT of four, we can tell that the first analgesic is more effective as it only takes two people to find one person achieving 50% pain relief, while the second analgesic required four people to find one who achieved 50% pain relief. Remember, the smaller the NNT, the more effective the analgesic. I now want to show you a couple of slides showing the outcomes of a number of trials. Using number needed to treat, we can determine which analgesic is more effective. These results are based upon a systematic review of literature. First, let's look at a single therapy of over-the-counter analgesic. Ibuprofen 400 or 600 milligrams and naproxen sodium 440 and 550 milligrams have very similar NNTs between 2.5 and 2.7. Acetaminophen has the highest NNT and thus is the least likely one to effectively manage a patient's pain. Remember, the smaller the NNT, the more effective the analgesic. Next, let's look at the same list, but let's add studies which combine acetaminophen with codeine. For many years, the analgesic of choice of patients with dental pain was a combination of 300 milligrams of acetaminophen and 30 milligrams of codeine. Interestingly, the acetaminophen with codeine combination is not very effective. All doses of ibuprofen alone are better than any dosage of acetaminophen with codeine, including 200 milligrams of ibuprofen. This next slide compares acetaminophen 500 milligrams and ibuprofen 200 milligrams alone with a combination of those doses. Not surprising, the combination of ibuprofen and acetaminophen is significantly better than either alone. 
This slide compares higher dosages of acetaminophen and ibuprofen alone with a combination of these higher dosages. Again, not surprising, the combination of ibuprofen and acetaminophen is significantly better than either alone. Both of these slides demonstrate the synergistic effect of combining these two analgesics because of their different pain control mechanisms. This slide compares the results of studies shown in the previous two slides with oxycodone-containing analgesics. The codeine combinations have not been included here because they have been shown to be inferior. Hydrocodone has not been included because there are very few published hydrocodone studies. These results show that the acetaminophen ibuprofen combinations are more effective than the combinations with oxycodone. Since oxycodone has a morphine equivalent unit of 1.5 and hydrocodone morphine equivalent unit of 1, it stands to reason that the ibuprofen acetaminophen is more effective than the hydrocodone combinations also. It should be noted that the 95% confidence intervals reflect the difference between the acetaminophen 1000 oxycodone 10 combination may not be significantly inferior to the ibuprofen acetaminophen combinations. It is hard, however, to justify prescribing the opioid combination when the non-opioid combination is as good, if not better, in its pain relief properties. Of particular note was the recent approval of the first ibuprofen acetaminophen combination tablet in the US. The tablet approved for over-the-counter use contains ibuprofen 125 milligrams and acetaminophen 250 milligrams. Comparative effectiveness of this new combination analgesic has not yet been performed. So what is my recommendation for managing acute post-operative surgical pain? I would recommend you're considering either a combination of ibuprofen 400, which can be either two over-the-counter tablets or one prescription 400 milligram ibuprofen tablet, along with one acetaminophen tablet, either 325 milligrams or 500 milligrams. The advantage of the acetaminophen 325 combination is that dosages can be doubled throughout the day and the FDA maximum allowance of the acetaminophen would not be violated. As most acetaminophen sold in drug stores and warehouse stores is extra strength acetaminophen, most consumers will have acetaminophen 500 milligrams in their medicine cabinets. In that case, patients must be careful not to exceed the recommended daily dosage. I want to emphasize that every patient is an individual and that while the acetaminophen ibuprofen combination is likely to be ideal for most, it is not appropriate for everyone given the contraindications for taking either acetaminophen or ibuprofen. Thus, clinician judgment must still be used. In summary, think twice before prescribing an opioid as there are alternatives. There are many causes of dental pain, but most acute pain has an inflammatory component. Therefore, NSAIDs are usually the most effective in managing this pain. While opioids have traditionally been used, today there are viable alternatives, including use of a combination of an NSAID, such as ibuprofen, with acetaminophen. By using the combination, two different pain mechanisms are blocked, thereby creating a synergistic effect. I hope that you feel that you are better equipped to manage acute dental pain. Please continue on to answer the questions that follow and complete the evaluation. Thank you for taking the time to participate in this activity.